Hi, and welcome back to Weldon Witness, Book Worm, Film Geek, and Friend. I'm your host, William McGinn, and it's great to be back today. So I have a lot to talk about today. So, And originally, I was going to start off this episode by talking about w how I would write a book. But th I decided to do something a little lighter since if you're watching this right now and rather than just hearing it, you'll see that I have a lot of books to talk about with you today. So so much so that I don't really have a bad book list to tell you about. But for starters, I'm going to be telling you about what it takes to be a movie and or book blogger. Now, a lot of people blog about a lot of stuff. But to start a, to start me off, I I saw, I did I was just on a walk with my mom one day um, back in May on twenty in twenty fourteen, and I just I came up with the idea because I had started getting into reading. It was about five months after I read Michael Vay, and then it was about uh, five months after I saw The Last Airbender. If you had if you had read the I mean, if you had watched the first episode, you know that those were the two things that got me into movie and book blogging. So the first thing I would say to do is to like what you're doing. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? If I was if I was in charge of blogging about something like space science or about um, about construction, then it would seem like work because those are things I'm not very interested in. If you're interested in them, go ahead and blog about them all you want if you like. I'm sure that they would be very more fascinating written by you than by me. And you basically, and you also, in order to be a movie and book blogger, you obviously, you have to like movies and books. It's not something that you can just wake up and decide you're going to do if you don't have any prior experience. That being said, anyone can be a movie and book blogger. That doesn't mean everyone should, but for those who do, um, just make sure you enjoy it. Otherwise, you'll just be doing more work for yourself. Another thing that I would recommend doing is um, is understand that, um, think about all those, all those news sites like Toronto Star. They publish um, like dozens and dozens of stories every day they're a they're a multi-million dollar company obviously and I'm no one's gonna expect you to read seven books a day I don't read seven books a day I only read like one or two a week and I only watch like one or two movies a day but the point is um a lot of people start projects and then don't finish them or don't go through with them much. I was worried when I started Weldon Witness that um, after about three reviews or even ten, I would just give up. Um, if you want to be a movie and book blogger, you have to um, you have to leap on it and understand that if you stop, you'll you'll always stop forever and it'll be a waste. It's like writing. It's like writing books. A lot of people try to start writing books and then give up halfway through. If you want to be a movie and book blogger. Just understand that um, that you should become in a bad mood on only after you've published like 50 or or even 30 um, 30 different types of of reviews. Otherwise, um, otherwise it won't seem as important. But then, but then it will seem important, and you can keep going and going. You also have to now that I just remembered. You have to understand to not limit yourself to one certain thing. There's someone on YouTube who only reacts to Disney movies, and while he has a lot of fans, and I applaud him for for having so, such popularity, um, I wouldn't recommend limiting yourself to one thing. It's true, I generally only read YA books, so it might be a bit hypocritical for me to stick to the teen fiction genre. I don't only stick to the teen fiction genre. There there's a series in here that's more in the adult category, but my point is, um, my point is, if um, if you like action movies, then review all the action movies you want. You might even review one a week or two a week. But you also have to think about the genres that you generally don't like, and you have to reach for those too. Once every once in a while. And it's also, it's also kind of funny how the grading system can work. Like, I grade on an A-plus to F scale, and I grade books on a four-star scale. A two and a quarter or below is thumbs down, or basically two or below is thumbs down, and a two and a half or above is thumbs up. And a funny thing is I've, I've seen a lot of movie critics that have 
an interesting storytelling like way that they've graded movies some of them will grade a lot of d's some will grade a lot of b's and as you, I've learned that as you grow older, grading something around the means of an A or F, A plus or F even, it can, they can, it can start to, you can start to limit yourself to the middle. And here's how that would work. Basically, as there's probably a movie that's your favorite or a movie that's your least favorite, a movie you love with a passion and a movie you hate with a passion. Those should be in respective order, an A plus and an F, because like, how can you um, ever expect a movie or book to be worse? But then, as time goes on, you might end up watching a movie that is that ends up taking your breath away so much that you obviously give it the highest grade, but then all the other movies you watch just pale by comparison. There's no other movie that's as good as that one, so there's no other A pluses that you can give. There's even a movie critic out there. I don't, I won't mention her name if you don't want to. Maybe I will, but um, she only grades like two A's a year, maybe just one a year, and. And so as a result, she hasn't graded an A plus in like five years. So eventually an A might turn into your new A plus. People might not expect you to ever give an A plus again. So, and, and if you never give any Fs, then a D or D minus will seem like the new F. It's, this is not a terrible thing. It's, it's who you are. Just, it's something to watch out for, something to be aware of. Just in case push comes to shove. So, um, and it's kind of happened with me too. I, back in 2015, I gave four A pluses at the end of the year. In 2016, I gave two. So far this year, I've given two as well, but, but the point, but that's my point. As you watch more and more movies, the worst grade and the best grade will be even more special and rare, probably. Okay, so... So that's it for, for my first part, and I'll let you have a music break. And when we get come back, we're going to be talking about sci-fi books, and then we're going to be talking about animated movies, which are two genres that I'm a big fan of, and I'll tell you why afterwards. So here you go. So welcome back. And obviously, this time we'll be talking about sci-fi books. Now, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do for this week, I was thinking sci-fi or fantasy, or sci-fi and fantasy. Because if you think about it, they can be one and the same. Some science fiction is so out there that it's almost, it's almost, it almost seems impossible, but and, and on the other hand, um, fantasy can have some elements of science in it as well. It's no wonder that in certain genres, it's an entirely different thing. But I looked at all of the books that I have that are related to sci-fi, in my view, more than fantasy uh, on on a very technical level, and I sort of realized I had a lot. So this week I'll be talking about what I feel are sci-fi books, but, um, but a little later I'll be talking about some fantasy books, maybe next week or the week after. So for starters, what I think makes a good sci-fi book, and this is where not many of them fall under this category, but um, I got this idea after I read Michael Vey. In that book, the characters all had superpowers, well, the teens anyway, but they had, they had powers that related to science, like electrolocation, which is a real thing that sharks use to see through muddy water, and the way that our brains focus have waves that can be related to electricity, that kind of thing. I like that kind of sci-fi because it makes it seem like these stories are not as far-fetched as if they were a fantasy. A far-fetched fantasy can be a lot of fun as well, but I'm just saying, I feel that's what sci-fi is mainly for to inspire us to g move forward and for, to give us all new ideas about how we can change the world. At, when you think about science fiction, like your dreams of flying, of having laser eyes, I know you have one of these dreams, don't seem as far-fetched. Um, so the first example I, that came to mind was this series, The Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Meyer. I remember I read this first book from my high school library. I was just looking for something to just not like because this 
this didn't seem like my type, but it turns out it's a, it's a retelling of Cinderella, only the main character, Cinder, is a cyborg. You know, cyborg from Teen Titans? Think about it like that, except um, this girl has like a built-in lie detector, she can't cry, she has a bionic leg, and she's, um, that her, that her evil stepmother, um, Lynn Audrey is her name, and her name is Lynn Cinder, can just take off all the time. And you see, she lives in a world where are, there are these people called Lunars, and they live on the moon, if how crazy is that? It's, I don't know if there are any trees on the moon or something. I don't know how they breathe, but they just do. And th like there are buildings and everything there. there. It's a whole new thing, but in but Lunars are able to intercept people's brainwaves and make it so that they can control them. Marissa Meyer admitted that if there was one thing she could change, it was how powerful these Lunars were because um, these people are, are, are so super powerful that it seems like any resistance would be destroyed with the snap of a finger, right? But she still managed to create an entire series with Cinder Scarlet, and this is also a retelling, actually, of Little Red Riding Hood. But the thing is, these two books are correlated into the same story. It's about the same corrupt system of Lunars and this evil queen named Levana, who is trying to marry um, Prince Kai after his father passes away and the, the Earth is now vulnerable. And um, you see, I was a little worried after I actually enjoyed Cinder and w really loved the cliffhanger. And Scarlet is the new protagonist, basically, not of the series, but of this one book. And I was worried that the cliffhanger that Cinder promised was not going to be there, but it is. And Scarlet's story ends up being just as fun, if not more fun. And the and stakes really get higher. And this is the introduction of a great guy named Carswell Thorne, a guy who was in prison but and is guilty, but is very hilarious and very likable. And then there's Cress by Marissa Meyer. I'm not going to describe each book fully in depth, but this is... Um, a version of Rapunzel. And this book, it's the only hardcover series I have. It's called Winter by Marissa Meyer, and it's a retelling of Snow White. All of these books are like a big family tree. They're correlated, and it's, and that's not the most interesting part. The interesting part is how addictive they are. This book is 800 pages, actually 824 pages to be exact, and it's the very first book I've read that was that long, but I flew through it in eight days. That's, well, the math is pretty simple. And not many books I read, I read that fast. But, um, and, but basically, um, each book has um, like maybe a dawdling beginning, but then a spectacular ending. And in those categories, they both get bigger and bigger with each book. For example, um, when I read Cress, um, by page 300, I was a little unsure if I was gonna like it, but then I ended up finishing the other 200 pages in less than two hours. So the Lunar Chronicles are a big win for me. The next one I wanted to talk about was The Illumini Files. It's a trilogy. The last book is going to come out in, like, March. It's a series by Amy Kaufman and Jay Kristoff. Um, um, they're a couple, and let me see. According to them, they are collectively 12 foot 5. So basically, they're, they're both, they both equal twice it. They both equal two me's in size, and I'm like six foot three. But this is a story about um, about a world that's um, run by this company called Baytech. And in the first book, Illumini, there are these two um, teenagers, um, Katie Grant, I'm pretty sure her name is, or Katie Heron, I'm, I'm not sure, but Katie, Katie Grant, I'm pretty sure, Katie Grant and Ezra Mason. And they just broke up after over a very big dispute. And it's like the year uh, 2575. It's a world where there's no more books. But, um, but the f thing is, um, this company finds out this secret, this very bad secret that Baytech's been trying to hide, and Baytech ends up attacking this entire city of Carenza, and there are some sur trying to hide it. And Katie ends up aboard a ship called the Alexander, and uh, Ezra ends up on a ship called the Hypatia, and there's another a ship called Copernicus, but these three ships are in space and being attacked by a ship called the Lincoln, a warship that's under the control of Baytech. And here's the thing. Um, there's a reason it's called the Illumini Files. This book takes place over just files. For instance, um, over text messages, over blogs, over... Um, 
what else is there over what people, um, when people look through um, video footage, what it is, but the visuals are incredible. I don't know if you can see them, but <laughs> the cover just came off. But, but also, um, everything about this book is very creative, but it also dares to do a type of, a type of story in a way I don't think anyone else has done because a book with just files, that sounds very boring. That sounds very one-dimensional and dry. And not to mention, this book is 599 pages and this book reminds you every single page. For instance, I'm a, this is page 228 out of 599. Well, 2228 slash 599. Each, um, each page has that. 352 slash 599, 353 slash 599. And I don't read many books that are that long. S and so with that plus that, I was worried I would hate it, but it turns out I, l I ended up loving it. And there's, especially the last 100 pages, it goes by, it goes by very quickly because, because there's not much on every page. So the fact is th these 600 pages feel like 300 by the end. And it actually tells its files in a way that really surprises you. It takes advantage of the fact we that we're reading these through files to trick us at a few parts of the way. There's a sequel called Gemina, and it's very good as well, if not a bit better. Even though it doesn't have the, these same characters at the helm, it's it's still very good, and not many books I read um, change the main characters and still end up very good. The next book um, series I'm going to be talking about is the Red Rising trilogy by Pierce Brown. It goes from Red Rising to Golden Sun to this monstrosity, Morning Star. Um, I, I picked this book up from my grade 12 library, and this is uh, actually an adult series, s and I almost never look in the adult section at bookstores and libraries, so if, that, if, my public, if my high school library didn't have this, then I probably would have never met it, but I'm glad I did. Red Rising is, like Illumini, takes place um, like hundreds of years before. Now there's life on Mars. I think there's life on the other solar systems as well, but Darrow, which is our protagonist, Protagonist lives on Mars as a red. These um, these communities are sorted into well into groups. Not all of them are of color. Actually, I think all of them are. It's um, I have it here somewhere. Basically, the red is the lowest ones. They are like coal miners, and they have to wear these wear these big suits that smell like piss, and they have to they have to mine with these very dangerous pythons. But Darrow is okay with that. He has a wife named Eo, and together they have a family, and they're getting by just well enough. In fact, um, in fact, there's there's also like pinks, greens, browns. Like some of them are artists, and some of them are like let's we could say hunters. But the point is, in Red Rising, um, Darrow's wife ends ends up just daring to break a rule, and she ends up executed just for that one rule. In fact, th it's so brutal that um, because of Mars's low gravity, Darrow has to pull her legs down so that the noose around her neck can will be able to choke her. But and so Darrow decides to try to sneak into the this institute um, called well the Institute and disguise himself as a gold after. Um, after a, he's convinced to to try to get help from a man and and infiltrate. Now, th the first book is kind of like The Hunger Games, so it does take place a lot in this institute, and I was a little disappointed that it was just going to be like that to prove his worth to rise up the ranks, but it ends up being very brutal. Like, if you thought The Hunger Games was brutal, where 23 k children die every year, then let's just say that in Red Rising, if you want to be at the top, then first you have to go into this, um, into this one tiny arena. You have to kill someone in order to progress. Basically, 50 people enter this institute, only 25 come out, and then not even that 25 will survive. It's kind of crooked where this, um, where this society is dominated by people who have killed someone. But, um, but basically, by the end of Red Rising, I was, I was actually, I was actually really hungry for Golden Sun. I, I gave it a try, and the ending of it, it. It, it was so incredible. It was so what just happened that my hands were shaking for hours. Um, the, it's, it's like this book does not have like the, 
does not have a symptom of being the second book in a trilogy. Um, Civil War ignites, and you feel very guilty for for how much Darrow had to do in order to be where he's at. You meet all of these special rebels, and you feel like um, you feel like Darrow is doing what he has to do, and he has to file his conscience away. And Morning Star ends up being like one of the best books I've ever read. Honestly, um, it's it's terrific, and I don't know what else I can say. Um, you should you should read them now, and but you're in for a brutal ride. And there's one more book series in the sci-fi I'm going to tell you about, and then we'll switch to animation so that there's enough time and I can give you a break. This is called the Itch Trilogy by Simon Mayo. It goes from itch to itch rocks to itch craft, like witchcraft. But itch is actually. It, that's the name of the main the main character, Itch or Itchingham Loft. Pretty a pretty good target for um, for someone who will be bullied. But basically, Itchingham collects elements of the periodic table. I took a chemistry in grade eleven. It was the one of the toughest uh, places that I've ever had to be, and um, a lot of people were really close to flunking that class. And um, like I don't know why I even tortured myself with it. But Itch makes chemistry fun again. It it teaches you more than a chemistry class will teach you because the stuff in it is memorable and it really makes you interested in these elements. Like, did you know that um, that arsenic, well, it's poison. Everyone knows arsenic is poison, but it accidentally brings some arsenic to a very warm greenhouse through his backpack and it ends up kind of boiling in there and then everyone ends up throwing up from, from ingesting the poison lightly. And also, did you know that there's um, there's something called tellurium, and it's an element that, if ingested, it can make you start to reek of garlic. For it can happen for days. Um, if I got a hold of some tellurium, just imagine how much revenge I could do. Basically, reading it, you feel like I felt like I was evil or something trying to conduct a plan to take over the world. Itch is, this Itch himself is not like that. He didn't bring in the arsenic on purpose and he doesn't put tellurium into everyone's drinks while they're not around. But he has a chemistry teacher called Nathaniel Flowerdew. He's not really the, the best teacher ever. In fact, and he's not even gloomy. He's very strict. And one time Itch has a friend named Cake who, who gives him all these elements and he gives him these special rocks and they're not on the periodic table, he realizes. They're, and they're so radioactive that that their, their radiation is deadly if exposed too much. And Flower Dew wants these rocks because here's the catch. These rocks are powerful enough to stop all of the, all of the coal mining and and oil reserves necessary to fuel everyone. These rocks could power cities and or continents. Um, but the thing is, Itch doesn't want these in the wrong hands. They could, this is like a coin toss of the rest of the world. And so he decides to hide them away until he can find out what to do with them. But people are getting impatient with him and they're starting to try to steal it, maybe even hurt him in order to do so. So I really enjoyed Itch and it, it brings a mystery as to, as to who ended up saving Itch from this explosion of sodium. Now I think, I bet you're thinking, sodium is not a dangerous element, it's um, it's on the nutrition facts, right? Well, you, what you usually ingest is sodium chloride as salt, but sodium on its own, when it's exposed to air, it can cause huge explosions. It It is so easily deadly. But know what I mean about being evil, you know? And Itch Rocks ends up being like 10 times as good. I loved Itch, but Itch Rocks became like my favorite book of all time next to two others for a bit. So you can tell that I really loved, I really love this series. The last book, um, this book does have a strange ending though. The one that I wasn't sure about it, how it how it would catch up to Itchcraft. Um, and Itchcraft is my least favorite, but it's still a very good one. And this time it's ending, it was actually very joyful, if you ask me. And so, so I have a different opinion of all the Itch books. So I was gonna tell you about uh, uh, my, what in my opinion is a bad one, I'll just, this one will just be one minute. This is Hyperion by Dan Simmons. It's like, it was written back in 1989. My, m my dad started reading it, but didn't like it, so he gave it to me. 
and so I took a shot at it and you could say that it's the worst book I've ever read with the best characters because this is basically a short story plethora of people on an adventure to try to get to this beast called the Shrike and trying to find out how they all came to be. And well, I just, I don't like short stories much. Like they just feel like wasted opportunities usually. If you like short stories, that's great. But this was basically just a collection and the characters seem to be getting nowhere. But I read this like over two and a half years ago, maybe three years ago, and I still remember all these characters and what they're like. So there's that. But still, I just, at, at almost 500 pages, this just seems like too much of a prelude. But anyway, now for the break you really deserve. I'm Next, after the break, we're going to be talking about animated movies, if you have forgotten. So, thanks again. Okay, welcome back. So... I have been a fan of animated movies since I was a little kid. I mean, when I was a little kid, animation was pretty much the only thing I watched on TV, right? Well, the, I don't... There's not much that I can say about what makes a good animated film because there's so much that can. And so as a result, I don't have many examples of bad ones. And I'm going to start with the good ones for stars. First, I wanted to talk about Chicken Run. I mean, yes, it's a stop motion animated film. Those are very artistic, um, like the Leica production. Leica and Ardman are both make plasticine and puppets. And they're today seen as as ways that are too hard, don't look good enough, and not make much money. But they are still doing it that way, and I hope that they still do, because um, because stop-motion animation is so underrated. And um, Chicken Run is, like, the highest-grossing anime stop-motion animated film ever, as far as I know. Well, of plasticine. So Chicken Run, if you don't know, it's... Um, it's a farm called Mrs. Tweedy's Farm, and there are about, you could say, 50 chickens in there. But they all talk. They're all British. This takes place in, like, the 1950s, you could feel. And they are trying to escape from their farm, which has a giant fence, razor wire, and guard dogs, and f flashlights. Um, and the main girl, Ginger, she, um, she tries to make everyone make everyone really hopeful about the escape. She tries to bring everything together. And one day she comes across um, a, a flying rooster named Rocky, played by Mel Gibson. He's the only boy out of all this. And she saw him fly. So she figures he'll teach them how to fly. We'll fly out, easy as that. It's not as easy. But this was the first movie I was actually kind of scared of. Um, even though this movie is rated G, it is, I would say it's PG. It's There is no swearing or in, in it or anything like that. But there are references to Schindler's List, The Great Escape, Stalag 17. Even the main hut is named Hut 17. This is basically a parody of all these Great Escape films. Films, but they are still very scary, especially the farmers, Mr. and Mrs. Tweedy. And the dogs are, well, they have, they have teeth that are, they have teeth as sharp as their claws. So, um, and you really start to feel like, um, if these characters don't get out of here, then they'll be killed. So, as, but that doesn't mean it's still not funny. It, it's hilarious. Um, one critic even said that he didn't think two minutes went by where he wasn't laughing out loud. Um, I don't know if it was the same for me. I would say it like five, every five minutes, but still, um, but still tr trying to get the chickens to fly. It's, it's so funny. And like the slapstick isn't just there for the slapstick, you know? And the and the ending climax is a perfect example of how to of how to make your movie exciting and how to end it on a very satisfying way. Next, I'm going to be talking about Shrek. It was also the first one. It was one of the first films that my family was really addicted to, alongside Monsters Inc. And let me just say, I think that Shrek is one of the most underrated, or maybe the most um, under ex under explained or under examined movie of in a while. Um, I would even go as far as to say it's my favorite romance movie. And I don't know if you would think of, of Shrek and think romance at first. You might think comedy. You might think animation. But Shrek not only has this very special animation, it was made back in 2001, and everything was so detailed. Everything felt so lifelike, like nothing I'd ever seen before. If the main character wasn't an ogre, you'd think that, um, you'd think that this was live action for its time or something like that. There's another movie that actually does this better that was released a decade later. But my point is, um, 
These movies have a way of showing that everyone and all bodies, all shapes and sizes are in their own way beautiful. And it's uh, Shrek is also a movie where you think ab about it a little bit after the end if you want. It's easy to examine. You think after the opening, is he really happy? Or is he just making the best of him being by himself? When he meets Donkey and he shoos him away, like he, when he's at dinner, he looks at the, at the window at his door and thinks, should he invite him in? He's not sure. He's confused about this. No one has given me that kind of affection before. No one wants my company like me. I've grown used to privacy and that I like it. Every, um, and later on, we learned that it's because people judge Shrek before they even know him. And that's why he's better off alone. So, um, and, but I'm not saying that it's a movie that you have to examine to enjoy. It's, it is very hilarious. It might lose some laughter over time, obviously, but, um, but Shrek's a movie that you have, you have to go back to, to really enjoy. You have to watch it, um, watch the entire 90 minutes to understand. And, um, and also, I like all of its sequels, even the third movie, which is, um, which a lot of critics say, the least favorite. I would say that the third focuses more on the humor than than the heart. It doesn't have as much heart as the other two, but um, especially during the play when Shrek makes everyone laugh at how bad, apparently, Prince Charming's performance is, we all laugh along at that, too. And also, the second movie also is... As also, in my opinion, has even better romance than the first one, because you think about Shrek and Fiona as a couple. Like Fiona was originally a human, and she's now the the ogress that was she was every night, the one that was depicted as a curse. And they meet her family. So, would you be a little upset if your um, if your daughter turned into an ogre? So, and Shrek realizes that Fiona's not really happy. So he decides to try to find a way to to make her happier it that's a very this is a very mature movie about an adult relationship and it, and this movie these movies um they really get you to pay attention because of the great animation you know so now for another one since there's a lot more to talk about the next uh, great movie that I think about is Wally, -E, the 2008 film. I remember when I first saw Ratatouille, there was a preview for it. it. It explained how the creators at Pixar, when they first came up with Toy Story, they also came up with A Bug's Life, Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo, and the last movie they talked about was Wally. -E. And it, you could say Wally -E is very close to a silent film, the first half, and then um, but all around a movie about the environment. This place takes this takes even longer than. Uh, before after our lives than the Illumini files or Red Rising it takes place in like you could say 2810 or 2800 and well it's it's actually very scary how how real it feels um there is so much trash that there are these these giant mounds of trash that are c that are made in cubes um by the wallies meant to clean up the mess there's only one wally left because no humans were around to aid in these creatures i mean robots and now there are sandstorms and and there's no life there i'd be surprised if anyone can even breathe on that place and and also you it might. I even saw read a review for Wally. -E. Um, one reviewer asked the director how um, how it feels to make a movie about some about a main character who doesn't talk. Uh, director Andrew Stanton says, "Oh, he talks. He just doesn't speak English." I can remember that for a while because because yeah, Wally -E doesn't speak English, but with his robotic sounds like wow. You, you really understand his emotions about being left alone for centuries. And when he collects all that stuff and you watch those, those films that must have been made about 60 years ago from now, and you see him holding hands about how lonely he is, um, it's hard not to cry, I admit. You could watch it a dozen times and just feel so sad at, and bad for Wally. So, and then it becomes a movie about the environment and, it's just amazing how to see these humans all of a sudden really care about our own world and and it's not really far-fetched how obese and lazy all of the rest of the humans aboard the axiom have become so it's a movie that proves that dialogue there a movie doesn't have to have dialogue to be incredible 
So what's next? We only we have a few minutes left. Um, oh, next I wanted to be talking about Strange Magic. It was pretty recent. It was released in January 2015, and it was made by George Lucas. It's basically a movie about these two divided worlds, but you could say it's a musical because this is basically the Moulin Rouge of animated films. There are about 15 times these people belt out into song, and these are pop songs. And it's about um, mainly a girl named Marianne and a fairy and who's probably as big as as tall as a ladybug and she ends up dumped or rather her she realizes that her fiance is just someone who will just fall in love with every guy he sees and doesn't really love the Mar the Marianne she is so she's all of a sudden she doesn't care about meeting someone she feels she's stronger alone and also but mainly there's an elf named Sunny who's in love with Marianne's sister Dawn but Dawn loves every guy she sees she and she doesn't really recognize his affections for her so she dares to go he dares to go into the dark forest and find the prison sugar plum fairy to so that she can create a love potion for him the thing is this sugar plum fairy is guarded in the dark forest by the bog king who for some reason is against love entirely and um and has kept the fairy in prison for a long long time so what I'll basically say is this movie what bombed at the box office and a lot of people really hate it. In my opinion, it's a movie where you have to understand what you're going into before you see it because I don't personally like a lot of musicals. I find musicals a bit annoying for my taste, but I'm but you know how I said in a previous episode that I root for the underdog in movies and books? Well, since Strange Magic was so critically panned, I decided to give it a shot with open arms and I ended up really into it. Um and I think that if you realize that there's a lot of music, you'll love it. Because, like, remember how I said that Shrek had, what, had a premise that all that everyone was beautiful in their own way? Strange Magic has, has that same message in a way, and you'd be surprised how well it displays its message behind all the songs. It manages to be like a rock opera without losing its message. And, and it's amazing because... In a way, Strange Magic doesn't have a main character. Like, you could say Marianne's the main character because she's the girl that we meet at the beginning, or you could say it's Sonny that's the main character because he's the one who, and who goes and gets the love potion, or you could say it's Dawn because she actually ends up kidnapped. You could, um, you could blend all these characters together and you don't feel like there's one person we focus on. I was very impressed with that. And so, and also the character designs, they're very interesting, very expressive. And the way Marianne and Dawn are modeled, or I mean, that's, uh, that's an animation term, but the way that they look, you, you really want to get to know them. They look very interesting. They look like your fan, they look like someone who belongs in a dream you had about a very good fantasy. So now on to what other movie? Oh, I also wanted to talk about Arthur Christmas. You might be thinking Arthur Christmas, like the Canadian cartoon Arthur. Nope. This is a movie by Sony Pictures Animation and Aardman, and it was released in 2011, and it's about the operation of Christmas. Because if you think about it, it Christmas might not make sense to some people when you look into it. There are, there are bi 2 billion kids in the world as of now, and there were about 2 billion kids in 2011 when this movie was made and so how do you get all of those presents delivered in one night how do you go down the chimney how do you fit all that stuff into your sack this explains that now it's a technology it's technology based there's actually a big a big ufo called the um what the s1 and it's actually run by a, fa a family of santas but and the one, one of them is Arthur. He's just the clumsy one who sees Santa as the best man ever, even though he might not be. And he wants it to be perfect for every kid. And he's, he's maybe looked down upon by his family, but he stays optimistic. And then one day, over a conflict about whether the old fashion or the new fashion is good, based off of the previous Santa prefers the old and the guy who's destined to be Santa named Steve, who's all about like military-esque types, he, um, they realize that in the operation, one present wasn't delivered. It was a glitch. And Arthur can't believe it. He, um, 
he wants it to be perfect for every kid. He sees that every kid deserves a gift. So he can't stop thinking about this, And but no one else cares. They see it as one problem. So Arthur t decides he has to try to get it himself in before this little girl wakes up in the morning. You might, that might sound like, um, like a big stretch for for one whole animated movie that costed a hundred million dollars but as time goes on you really think about how this little girl might react in the morning if they don't get there about the true meaning of christmas and well and who santa really is as a person and also there are some incredible lines that might stretch the g but like for instance um the mother pl who actually vo uh, played Umbridge in Harry Potter said um, on at dinner, I was stopped by a polar bear. Good thing I took that online um, that online survival course or we would have less than one person at the table today. Or um, Grand Santa says, you may be next in line, but you'll never be get to be Santa unless you knock him off. Or what if you do wake the old nipper? A whack in the head with a sock full of sand and a dab or whiskey on the lips they don't remember in the morning. <laughs> but basically, um, the Grand Santa played by Bill Nye, he's hilarious, and the last 10 minutes are very intense. Um, you'll, you might sweat, you might, um, you might just re like clutch your hands to your head thinking, is, is he gonna make it, is he gonna make it? But yeah, so now I'm just gonna talk about a few movies that I'm not a fan of, and I'm not gonna go too in debt. I'm not a big fan of the Despicable Me movies. The first one was was okay, but a little too awkward for my taste. Heartwarming in the end, but yeah. The second one I just felt was just too silly and just a step down. Um, and the third one, I felt there were way too many plot points. It was like they were trying to shovel in everything they could for this third installment, and as a result, none of the stories ended up fitting. Um, but I did love the Minions spinoff. That one was, in my opinion, the best, but ironically, it's the worst reviewed on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, the, another movie that I wasn't a fan of was Frozen. I liked Strange Magic just and be, primarily because the songs were actually not that cheesy. About 75% of the time, I really enjoyed them. The other half, the other quarter, it felt like, okay, that song was a little unnecessary, but in, but the songs here, I feel they distract too much from the story, and the story all itself also has quite a few significant flaws. And also, I'm a big Ninja Turtle fan, and there's a fully animated film in, that was made in 2007 called TMNT. I wasn't a big fan of that. I felt it was a little too cruel and just not fun enough. I don't know what else to say, but... But basically, I love animation. I will love it forever, and it's one of the main reasons that I got started in in reviewing because a world a world without animation just seems so boring to me. So thanks a lot for listening once again to Weldon Witness, Bookworm, Film Geek, and Friend. I had, I actually had loads of fun doing this one with you, and um, and I hope I have as much fun next time. So. See you next time. We'll play some more music for you, and you can contact us on Twitter and Instagram at uh, DCSI Riot Radio. And I'm well. I'm William McGinn signing off.